All right, so change of plans. I was going to do uh, Reservoir Dogs, but I don't want to burn myself out on Tarantino, because especially I'm going to be doing something with somebody in a little bit, coming weeks on Tarantino. So taking a rest from him, I will get to Reservoir Dogs eventually. I re-signed up for HBO Max just now and saw David Cronenberg's The Brood, which is usually on Max, and I said, it, that's it, because I've been talking about wanting to talk about this movie since the beginning of the channel and Cronenberg in general, which if you've seen my scanners video, this is the only Cronenberg that I've done so far. And it's in my top three Cronenberg that I've seen, but I am not huge, huge into Cronenberg. I love him, but there's still movies I haven't seen by him, especially Shivers, which is a classic of his, which I just never got around to. I got to do that soon. But I've seen most of his famous movies, um, Naked Lunch and um, Videodrome, Scanners, The Fly, of course. It goes down the line. Of all of them that I've seen, Rabbit is another great one. The Brood has always been my favorite. Like, something about Art Handel's performance in this and... Anyone who uh, knows the Disco Biscuits, friends of mine who are fans of them and stuff, if you haven't seen this movie, check a clip or something out, because this guy, Art Hintle, who, Hintle, who plays um, the main character here, he looks just like Barber, the guitar player from the Biscuits. Just like him, I even, that last time I watched this, I had to Google it, just to see, like... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, like, he had an alternate persona back then and he was in this movie, but he wouldn't have been this age. But he looks just like him. Samantha Egger does phenomenal in this movie. And Oliver Reed is, is great, as always, in this. If anyone hasn't seen The Brood, I'll just read the, uh, the description here, because it's better than what I'll come up with. Ex-spouses are locked in a brutal custody battle over their daughter when one, tr one turns to therapy, Samantha Egger's character, that encourages her to basically give in to her rage. It trailed off at the end there. <laughs> you had to hit a button, so I had to make that shit up at the end. But that's true. Like It's basically she's going through like this experimental therapy to deal with her anger at her father, her parents, and everything, and he's just trying to be a good father here and protect his daughter while she's going under this therapy under Oliver Reed's character. And his intentions are a little questionable. We'll get into that. But this is probably one of the more tame Cronenberg films when it comes to body horror and stuff like this. There is a lot of it in here, especially near the end. The, the design of the kids, like all of her kids of rage that they call it in this, creepy shit. Dave, you watch this, you know what you what we do. Fucking drop kick to the face <laughs> every single time. Any type of killer kid. That's a rule on this channel. You get attacked by a murdering kid, you drop kick that motherfucker faster than you can do anything else. They're creepy as shit in this movie, though. So let's talk Cronenberg's The Brood from 1979. This is going to be a fun rewatch. Now, I always usually mention a score in a movie, since I'm a musician. I, I, it's one of the first things I hear, as well as sound design. The sound design's excellent in this. Most of Cronenberg's films are like that. The score's okay in this. It's not a favorite score of mine or anything like that. I don't even really remember it until I just heard the, like, the opening score here. It's a good score, but it's nothing memorable for me. I think Howard Shore did the music. He's, he's done some great stuff, but this one doesn't really stand out for me. Now, on the whole body horror with Cronenberg, like he pretty much, as we know, invented the genre of body horror. Sure, you can cite movies from before him, of course, like with anything else. But the whole term body horror exists because of David Cronenberg. And I feel like he it's very Italian-esque. Like how when I always talk Italian horror and I'll bring up that the way that like Bava, Fulci, Argento, Martino, Margareti, like all of them just knew how to just linger on kill scenes and just like, you know what drills coming through this fucker's head or you know this bitch is getting stabbed and you know it's happening, but the way they draw it out and just keep putting it in your face until you can't take it anymore and it's like, all right, just, just do it already, kill him and then you get great gore and stuff. Very similar to how I always viewed Cronenberg's usage of his body horror. He always loves to push the limit. Like, just when you think you've seen some disgusting-ass shit, 
it dials up to 11 afterwards and he's just excellent at doing that um it feels very very italian-esque for me though like it, it does and i'm sure he was in- inspired by a lot of those directors because who wasn't <laughs> back in the 70s thinking about it though even scanners is pretty light on the body horror i mean there again is some great stuff in there we have one of the greatest head explosions of all time there's not a lot of the real body horror he's known for. Like, Rabbit has a lot of it. And um, The Fly, obviously, all the effects and everything in that, the effects work is phenomenal. Videodrome and with the, the vagina belly for VHS tape thing. Like, all of those things come to mind for me first before these two films, before Scanners and The Brood. Even though this is probably my favorite screenplay of a Cronenberg film. Like, the story alone of this makes this my favorite Cronenberg film. Which, if I recall correctly, I'm sure some of you know, but I'm pretty sure on this. Cronenberg wrote this movie while he was going through a divorce and, like, custody battle and stuff like that. So this is his sick way of dealing with it. (laughs) By making this sick movie, dealing with, you know, custody over a kid and stuff like that. Genius. But guy's got issues, of course. One thing I got to say, though, the cinematography is gorgeous in this movie, like with most Cronenberg. It's very, very good looking. All the the, the framing and the, the shots that he chooses to make when, uh, oh, what's his name, man? <laughs> is it Pat? No, it's not Pat. The main Art Hindle's guy. Frank. <laughs> his name is Frank. His wife's Nola, I remember that. And um, Dr. Raglan is Oliver Reed. So we have a great cast here, too. All the cinematography is great when, like, Frank is walking up the stairs and the the shot from below the stairs of him walking up. Great camera choices and stuff during this movie. The A girl's adorable here, his uh, daughter, that, that she has to go through all this, man. Like, as a father now, like, I don't remember the first time I saw The Brew, but as a father, and especially this movie is from a father's point of view. Like, I mean, explores Nola's side as well, the wife and the mother. But this is basically his battle here. Like, he's trying to do everything he can for his daughter. She's the one that's being corrupted by this doctor. Now, Oliver Reed is just fantastic, as always. Just in the opening scene with the guy who's, I think his name is Michael, right? And that's why he's, but he's like, feels transgender, feels like a girl. He's called himself Michelle. And Dr. Raglan, Oliver Reed, is basically pretending to be his father so this is the th- experimental therapy i mean <laughs> it gets much weirder with nola of course but this is his therapy i guess like he pretends to be your father your mother or whoever was gave you a lot of guilt and insecurities and stuff in your life and lets you be able to talk to them like through him and stuff pretend that's that person and get all your frustration out all your your feelings out all your hatred your whatever it may be so it doesn't seem like he's really like an evil doctor in this movie i never took it that way it's not like like he understands what's happening and he knows he shouldn't be doing what he's doing with nola But at the same time, he does try to help at the end of the movie. And it does seem like he's generally trying to help some of these people. It doesn't seem like it's a complete scam. Let me know what you guys think about that. Do you think that Dr. Raglan and his whole therapy thing is just a complete bunch of bullshit? Because there is a character later on who says that there's lawsuits against him and stuff. But every doctor gets a lawsuit, (laughs) like, here and there. So, what's your thoughts on that? Is he a total just bad intentions all the way through, or is there some gray area here, like I always see it? So, Nola is in this facility, being treated by Rag- Raglan, right? Raglan, yeah. I'm gonna forget that many times. And she's not allowed really any visits, but she's allowed visits from her daughter, to spend time with her daughter. And Frank ends up finding these cuts and bruises on his daughter's body. And the first thing he's thinking is it's happening either here by my wife or it's happening by somebody here in this facility. And this guy has every goddamn right in the entire world. Are you serious to go here and start asking him all these questions? Oops. I don't know what that was. But he has every right to be asking all these questions. Like, (laughs) this guy has, like, the balls 
To, and that's what I mean, though. Like, he doesn't flat out, like, tell him, go fuck yourself. Or, like, you know, like anything like that. Like, he does try to explain. He does try to help. And he does say to Nola later on that Frank's just trying to be a good parent. He's just looking out for the daughter, just like Nola would. So, again, I don't want to keep going on Raglan, but it's a very interesting character. Just the name of this film, The Brood instantly drew my attention when I first heard of this film and saw it for the first time. Can't remember where. It's killing me, like, how long ago I saw this movie. It's got to be 10 years at least. But just a great name. Any of the, you wrestling fans back in the day, remember The Brood? The Hardy Boys with, uh, not Gandalf, <laughs> the uh, Gangrel, right? And they sip the chalice of blood and stuff. Those, that, those people, that was my shit. Back in WWF. I loved The Brood. Maybe that's why The Brood, the film, is my favorite. This film also might have just the best acting in a Cronenberg film for me. Like, seriously. I mean, Ironside in this in Scanners is brilliant. But Samantha Eggers here with Oliver Reed are Kendall's great too. But it's not like a, a breakout huge great performance here. He carries the film, though. But Eggers, all her scenes with Oliver Reed are just fantastic. Like the way that when they're having their little therapy session and she's saying like, you know, uh, he's telling her, you know, he's acting as Candace, the daughter, and she's talking to her daughter in her mind. And he's saying, mommy, you hurt me. Like you hit me with your fist. You scratched me. And she says, oh, oh darling, like mommies don't do that. I would never do that because mommies don't do that. All of her dialogue, man, is fantastic in this movie, like throughout all of it. And it's a shame she's not in it as much. You know, I mean, like Art Kindle, Frank, he's in most of this movie. Olive Reed's in a decent amount. She's not in it nearly as much as the other two, and it's a shame. I mean, it it fits the story, so I don't have an issue with it, but I would love to see more of her in this. Might be my favorite performance ever from Eggers, too. Like, just her facial expressions in this movie. When she's, and she's thinking about it, and he says, like, they don't, like, mothers never hit their kids. And she the way she just... Like, looks in the distance. Like, she looks like she's fucked up mentally, and she is. But the way she portrays that is brilliant. Like, the way that she has that stare that she's half in another world and half still in reality. She plays it absolutely brilliantly here. I don't know why I'm blanking on the name, but the grandma of the daughter of Candace... Great job, too. And her death scene is really cool. Like, when that creepy-ass kid goes out and just whack, what is it, whacks her on the head with a hammer or something, right? They're so creepy, like I said, man, in this movie. These kids are, the design on them is excellent. Like, what weird, deformed-looking kids. And so the whole idea that of this premise here that I've always taken from this movie is that this whole therapy that Dr. Raglan is doing with Nola that he does with pretty much everyone else is to let your rage out completely and let it all go. But in Nola's case, her rage is so strong that it actually manifests into other beings. Like it manifests into these children. That's why they're her brood. They're her children. That's what I've always taken from it. Like, let me know if you guys have any other like opinions on that because that's pretty much how I've always taken this movie is that her she's so full of, of rage that it manifests these other beings like in a physical manifestation really great idea too all right what a fantastic fucking shot this is after the whole killing of the grandma I'm pretty sure it's the grandma right the aunt it's some relative I think but she gets whacked with this hammer or mallet that this kid's using so many times, and this is another thing with this movie, it's, I hate the word slow burn, but it's it's very 70s. Like, this feels like your slow burn 70s horror. Maybe why you don't hear the brood on many people's top Cronenberg films, because it's just doesn't, it doesn't hit the all-out insanity that the 80s movies he did reaches. I'm pretty sure that's my guess on why this film isn't as beloved as his later films 
by by his fans. Like I don't hear the brood praise nearly enough that it should be. But she gets the living shit killed out of her <laughs> with that mallet, man. And it's brutal. Like she keeps getting hit in the head, whacked, and please stop. And the the score is good, but it sounds very psycho with like the down 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 and violin stabs. It sounds just like psycho. And uh, then we get an amazing shot. The first time we see the kid's face very briefly and i love the hoods that they wear too so they're just hooded kids with these deformed faces like cleft lip cleft lips and shit like that real cool but the daughter candace sees the kid really fast and he's holding on to the rails of the staircase uh, then you see him for a quick shot and he just runs and he takes his hands off and the blood stains stay on the uh posts that's a fantastic shot now again just all the the commentary here from Cronenberg on, like I said, what he was going through at the time, just imagining your five-year-old daughter having to go through all this trauma, especially this first thing here, like seeing her grandmother, and, and yeah, it's on the mom's side, it's uh, Nola's mother, get brutally but bludgeoned and see this creepy-ass kid run away, like... That is so traumatizing for anyone, but a five-year-old? Like, imagine that's your kid. Like, this guy has every right to kill every motherfucker around her, his daughter at any time. And he's such a great dad, Frank, too. Like, with the little scene with him uh, when he brings her home from the police station after the psychiatrist saw her and he has his worries for this kid that he's seen you know, like middle-aged men with ulcers, you know, kids with ulcers the same as middle-aged men. All this trauma that she just went through, and he's such a good dad, man. He takes her home, he puts her in bed, you, you don't want to read a story tonight? He's like, do you want to tell me a story? Like, all of that's adorable and, like, really makes you just love this guy's character. I like the whole backstory that we learn on Nola, that she had two alcoholic parents. She had a mother who was physically abusive to her as an alcoholic, and then had a father who was codependent alcoholic and never wanted to get involved. So he just never helped her. So, I mean, you feel for this woman. I mean, and, and, and Agar, her performance just really sells, and you really feel for her. But, like, the whole, and there's a psychic link here, too if I remember correctly. Like, it's not just like a physical manis... Even though she's physically manis... Manistating these... Mani whatever the fuck the word is. She's creating these little kids. And they have... They're like... They have no sex. They have no navel. Which means that they weren't born naturally. And I think they're colorblind, too. Like, there's a bunch of weird shit with them. And the cleft lip and stuff like that. But... There's a psychic link between her and her brood, her children, that she's creating from her rage, that she's not aware of. That's how I've always taken it. Like, let me know if you, if you think she knows what these kids are doing, because I'm pretty sure they just act, like, through some type of telepathic link or psychic link with their mother, and, like, when they're mad at her mother, like, who just got brutally murdered— she doesn't know that happened, but the kid is acting on her feelings towards her mother, and I think that's very interesting. That's a great fucking idea for a movie, to have somebody, a mother that's blissfully unaware that her weird children that shouldn't even be existing are carrying out murders and killing people that she loves but has a lot of issues and repressed you know, insecurities and problems with. And she has no idea that they're doing this. Great idea for a, for a story. Little thing off topic. Number whatever you want to number it at this point in this video. <laughs> but a lot of fun stuff coming up this coming week. I'll be coming home tomorrow night from upstate with my daughter. So I'll be back home tomorrow night. Friday night we are watching Sleepaway Camp. Tuesday, me and Dave at Savage Zombie Reviews. We will be watching Adam Wingard, The Guest. With uh, Dan Stevens, one of my favorite films of the 2010s, Tuesday after, uh, evening, 5 p.m. And then next Thursday, uh, Thursday, the 7th, is the interview with Lauren Marie Taylor from Friday 2. Now, because the strike is still going on, we're not going to be able to do it live. I'm going to have to pre-record it with her and then premiere it. So I'm going to make a post 
I don't want it to be obvious. Like, I doubt people are looking around at this, but they're not allowed to talk about their careers, really, and have interviews during the strike. So it has to look like we did this, recorded this before the strike. So I don't want to put a like blatant message saying, hey, we, for the interview, <laughs> and it's dated like a week before the interview. So I'll figure out a way, but to get questions from anyone who wants to ask her questions and stuff. That way I have a whole bunch of them, and then I can rapid fire them at the end with her, and then I'll premiere it. So that way everyone can hang out and talk during it. So that's what's going on with that. Back to the movie. I don't know what it is, but this, all the stair shots in this movie, are, are, I love the way they're shot. Like, any time a character is going up the stairs or down the stairs, anywhere. Really, really good cinematography. That's the name of the therapy. Psychoplasmics is what Dr. Raglan calls his therapy. It purging, you know, rage and emotion and stuff through and causing physiological changes. Psychoplasmics. That's a cool name, I guess. So then Nola's father arrives in town. And he ends up in a little bit going down to the facility and demanding to see his daughter. He's very drunk. But this guy, I would handle things so much different. <laughs> this guy gets denied to see his own daughter after his ex-wife was murdered? No. Like, no is the answer to the, any of those, any questions following that. I'm going in and I'm seeing my fucking daughter. Like, end of story. I don't care who you are. Get the hell out of my way. That's, that's how that would go. This guy just turns around and gets back in his car <laughs> and proceeds to get murdered over it. So this is where we have the scene with that person who was under Dr. Raglan's care at one point, and he's telling Frank about psychoplasmics, and he starts telling him that it's a form of, basically a form of lymphatic cancer, and that Dr. Raglan and his therapy is the cause of this in this guy. So this guy's dying and shit of cancer all because of this doctor. Again, there's a lot of gray area, though, with Dr. Raglan, because he really feels like he's doing something good for these patients. He sees it getting out of control, and I'm sure there's a type of God complex, especially with Nola, because he refers to her later on as her Queen Bee. So, I mean, like, he's proud of what he created with her, or helped her create, but he does try to help in the end. So, again, he's a very, very, very interesting character. Also, excellent touch having Candace wear that, like, same red hooded jacket and everything, the same that the brood of kids wear. Really cool decision there, too. All right, I'll say now, I'm fucking adoring this rewatch. <laughs> like, I don't know if, because I'll make a statement here that I was just pondering for a few minutes before I wanted to go on record saying it. This movie might be one of the best horror films dealing with parenthood and ch and having children. I'll, th I've said it now. It really is. Like, I don't know if it's the mood I'm in. I've been up here with my daughter for the week, maybe. I feel more parental. <laughs> I don't know. But everything. Like, when um, the father of Nola, Barton, when he calls Frank and he's saying he's back at that old house and it's got me and stuff, and then he's, you see from his perspective of being a father and dealing with what's going on with his daughter in this psychiatric place, that he can't even say that his ex-wife, that his daughter's mother was murdered. Can't even tell his daughter that her mom's dead. All of this is explored so well with every character here. Like, it, it's one of the best. Like, I've made that decision now. It's one of the best horror films to deal with parenthood. Like, it, it, excellent script. This is why this is my favorite Cronenberg film. We even have the uh, the love interest. I forget her name. Probably the low point of the movie for me. Like, any scenes with her, she's, she's great. she does great. Like, she doesn't do a bad job acting. Just not really where my priority is and my interest is watching this movie. It's on the whole family dynamic with Nola and Frank and Candace and the brood and stuff. But they even show him as a parent, a single father, who's trying at the same time to save his kid and his wife in some way if he can. And shows him trying to have like a normal relationship with somebody. Like That's excellent too. Then Barton, uh, Nola's father, he gets the godly, ever-living shit killed out of him. 
by the same kid. Looks like the same kid. I mean, you can't tell the difference. I guess they wear different jackets. I don't remember if they do at the end. But one of the kids there, and then he ends up dying when he tries to kill Frank. Because Frank shows up, like, too late, but <laughs> in time for him to survive. So Frank's alive. Barton, dead. Alive, dead. <laughs> and then we end up finding the whole information out about these kids with the autopsy that the police do. They have, like I said, no navel, so they're not naturally born. They have no natural teeth, which is, I guess, why their faces all fucked up. <laughs> and they have, like, this psychic link that they end up finding out with, with Nola and causing them to do all this. And, yep, they are colorblind, see? Also, the lighting during the autopsy with the purple light, that looks fantastic. Then Nola ends up calling the house. And it's the teacher that he's kind of having a thing with. Now all her rage is going towards this bitch. <laughs> and you, and her death scene's great, too. Like, there's great kills in this movie. I mean, it wouldn't be a, a video by me if I didn't do it one, one of these, at least. But they they did the autopsy on this weird-ass kid that never should exist. And that shit doesn't make national news, like, overnight. <laughs> Every the whole country should be hearing on the news that some weird specimen creature kid was found that's colorblind, wasn't born naturally, has no teeth. Like all of this would be all over the news, but none of it is for any reason. Man, the scene when he goes to Candace's daughter and says, like, now that he saw the think the creature dead, he doesn't know there's more of them. And he goes to his daughter and he says, like, I know what happened at grandma's. I know you saw it. He's like, but I just saw it. It's dead. And she starts tearing and just hugs him. That's heartbreaking, man. Like, that, that is so adorable. See, now we get more silver lining or gray areas or whatever you want to call it with Dr. Raglan. He knows shit is getting out of control. He knows that now both grandparents and parents of Nola are dead. Because of these creations that he is ultimately responsible for. So he does shut down the whole clinic. And send everybody but Nola to municipal care. So this is what I keep saying. It's like this, he does have some type of conscience. He's not just like, fuck it. Like, <laughs> I'm doing whatever I want. And nothing. No, that's all that matters. Like, he does care a little bit for these patients at least. To have the at least the decency to do this, to close the place down and send them all to an actual care facility, like so, I, I just love his character. I mean, and Oliver Reed playing him just makes it so much better. Of course, this is one of the best scenes in the movie, with the in the classroom with the teacher's death, and this is very. I would be not surprised if I heard Don Mancini come out and say he was inspired by this scene for Child's Play too. When Chucky kills the teacher, very similar, not just because it's in a classroom, and, and but it's also the kid is kind of Chucky size. So, like, I don't know. It, it reminds me of it. But this woman proceeds, like, two of the kids come in, different colored jackets, and they just proceed to give this woman the most absolute, positive, most top-tier, malignant type of ass-beating that leads to severe death. <laughs> that you could imagine. Like, it's brutal. All in front of a class full of children. It is a brutal scene, man. And, like, when, and he, again, he's way too late. <laughs> he shows up, Frank, and she's just dead on the floor with a pool of blood. Her head's been bludgeoned in. It looks like they're using little toy mallets. <laughs> So it kind of takes a little bit of it away because it doesn't. It looks like you got to whack these people like mad times with these things to kill them, like much more than. But who knows? Maybe they have superhuman strength or some shit. Yeah. So I take back what I said at the very beginning about the score. I forget, I guess, every time I see it, until I see it again, how great the score is in this. Well, like I said, it's Howard Shore. I mean, he did fucking Lord of the Rings. <laughs> the guy's phenomenal. So it is a great score. It's just not really memorable. Like I said, like I, I will never remember this score. But while I'm watching it, it's very effective. It's beautiful. It's great. All the the snow cinematography, like all the shots with uh, Frank heading to the facility, gorgeous. Like all of that looks great. The snow on the ground when he's creeping up to the cabin, the whole look of that structure. It's like a cabin, but it has an attic. 
and that's where the brood lives, and Nola lives in the bottom part. All of that, it looks fantastic here. Like, it, it's a very iconic building for people who have seen this movie. Like, if you just showed me a picture of the structure here, I'd know instantly from the brood. It, it's very distinct. But yeah, so Frank ends up at the facility because after they murdered the shit out of the teacher, they the kids took Candace. So, I mean, now his kid's been kidnapped. Like, he should, he's handling, again, I guess, just like his uh, father-in-law, he's handling this very, very, very tamely. And good for him. Like, that he's not just walking in there with a gun to that woman's head saying, where is our child? Like, <laughs> good for him. I don't, I don't know what I'd do with that situation. Like I said, I haven't seen all of Cronenberg's films. But of the most of them that I've seen, the scene between Oliver Reed and Art Kendall, when they're talking before he go and he's persuading him to go into NOLA and to try to persuade her and play the apologetic husband that he wants his family back so that he can go up and get Candace from the brood so it relaxes her rage, all of that might be my favorite dialogue in a, in a Cronenberg movie. Like, every line from Oliver Reed, especially, is delivered brilliantly there. And then he goes in to see Nola. And then we see the she went infamous shot, too, when she lifts the white, you know, uh, dress that she's wearing, gown. And we see the egg sacs or whatever the hell those things are. Like, <laughs> she has, like, all these weird lesions and growths on her body. Like, this is the only body horror, really, in this movie. Besides from, like, how the form the kids look and, like, the fantastic gore from the kills. This is what I mean. It's very tame. Same with Scanners, with the body horror, compared to his later films. But, I mean, I can't even say that, because Rabbit is a lot more on the body horror. And Shivers I haven't seen, but I'm pretty sure, from what I've heard, it's the same way. But this is a great idea, too. And this shows that he does care a bit. Dr. Raglan, because he is risking his life and ultimately does, because he ends up getting killed. He tries Frank to talk to Nola and tries to calm her down, and he's able to get Candace almost out of there, and then her rage just kicks in. And just from that, the brood wakes up, and they end up killing the shit out of Raglan. <laughs> so he's finally gone. He doesn't have to deal with the guilt of all this freaking tragedy he's, he's caused in his career. And she gets stuck in a closet, and just, that's a tense scene, too. Like, just, again, just because a child's involved, a five-year-old and stuff, and these murderous group of deformed kids are beating down the closet, like, trying to get in there. And then he ends up strangling Nola to death, and that kills all the kids. So that psychic link that they have, once she's dead, like the queen bee, like, the whole hive dies. The brood is done. But... Even though it's not big on the body horror, what an excellent reveal that is. Like, you you want to know how she's giving birth to these kids the whole movie. And uh, then when she lifts that gown up and you see all the, whatever it is that they were born from, what an excellent reveal. Uh, so they're all dead, except for Frank and Candace, and he takes her away. And then we get the great ending that shows the little lesions on Candace implying heavily that she's just like her mother, that she's going to be able to eventually, to give birth to her own brood. Excellent ending, excellent script, excellent casting, excellent acting, excellent directing, excellent movie. The Brood by Cronenberg, 1979. So awesome. All right, guys, that's it for tonight. <laughs> I'm traveling tomorrow. So, sleep away camp, Friday night, 8 p.m., and uh, wherever you're from, hope you're having a good morning, afternoon, or night. I'll talk to you soon. Take care, guys. That wasn't supposed to be the fingers. <laughs> Fuck you.